Hey, everyone. Welcome to Time Sensitive. This week, Andrew's in conversation with the world-renowned graphic designer, design critic, and educator Michael Beirut. He is a partner at the firm Pentagram in New York City and has written on design in culture for many years, in addition to publishing various books on design. What did you talk with him about? So as someone who's been practicing for over four decades and is widely considered to be, as you said, like a living master of graphic design, I wanted to unpack some of the things he's learned along the way, the insights he has from his journey through many brands and many initiatives. He very much sees his craft as a passport to enter worlds he wants to learn about, from finance to politics to education. And at a time when brand is seemingly everywhere, I wanted to hear from Michael about the ways in which the practice of design can be consequential. Right, have meaning. I mean, he can speak to the world-changing capacity of design. And has written beautiful criticism for a long time, more about culture through design. Michael and I both share this connection with Massimo Vignelli, so it's great to chat a bit about the days at Unimark, where he collaborated daily with the Vignellis, and really hear about that exit when he actually left the nest and went to Pentagram. I'm super compelled to hear the Vignelli stuff. Um, can't wait to listen to this. But before we get into it, we'd first like to thank our season six sponsor, like Cole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. With permanent campuses in both Paris and Hong Kong, and opening next year a third campus in Shanghai, as well as various traveling schools, Le Cole offers a wide range of classes, each lasting from two to four hours. With a maximum size of 12 students, these courses are taught by a group of 50-some teachers, art historians, gemologists, jewelers, and artisans, all of them experts in their field. Le Cole's teachers bring a specific hands-on approach and a particularly high level of jewelry expertise that can't be found anywhere else. Art history lessons, for example, are based on unique historical pieces taken straight from the Le Cole collection. Introductory courses on jewelry making techniques are given by high level practitioners, and gemology is taught by observing real stones and using professional gemology instruments. You can learn more about Le Cole and its many course offerings at www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And now, here's Andrew and Michael. I thought we'd start with something really pretty simple, which is beyond just putting words and pictures together. What makes something design? Maybe we can narrow it to graphic design to be a little more specific to your experience in your personal view of design. Um, well, I think graphic design is unusual amongst the design professions because graphic design is almost always about something else. I think architecture, the design of the building is the building, fashion design, the design of the garment is the garment, and product design, the same thing. Graphic design, there's a subject matter that is external, that comes in from the outside to begin with, right? And if you're a commercial designer, some client says, look, I've got this message I want to communicate, and here's the audience I want to communicate it to, and when they get the message, I want them to buy this or vote this way or change their mind about this or have this kind of experience. That part of it, I think, makes it different. It makes it difficult for some people to go into because the impulse that often makes you become a designer is about being creative. You don't have autonomy in those situations because you're participating in this exchange, system. you know, the system that's, that's not of your own making. On the other hand, there are some people who go into it almost exactly for that reason, and I would classify myself in that category. I loved art when I was a kid, even though it was completely foreign to you know my middle class suburban Cleveland upbringing. I wasn't surrounded by artists, or I wasn't in some kind of artistic milieu. I was growing up in '60s cookie cutter America, America, suburbia. You know, I had supportive and loving parents and a mom who took me to Saturday morning art classes at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which is one of the world's great institutions, although 
you know, I, to me, it was just the art museum downtown. You know, as someone who liked to draw and make pictures and paint and do things like that, and someone who had actually, all, even in the first and second grade, realized that I could kind of parlay that into getting a bump up in my grades if I could decorate the cover of the book report with right. some extra special kind of like uh, thing. Incredible that, ballpoint. Ben. Exactly. There's amazing yeah. stories from your childhood that I'm, <laughs> I'm super excited to get into, actually, that you've shared in, yeah. in books and in various talks. In terms of design, in terms of good design and bad design, I'm really curious what you think about it. how much is taste and how much is quantifiable? Again, to kind of like put it in the context of other design disciplines, graphic design is a very low threshold of function. You know, it discharges its function fairly simply. If it's words and pictures, you simply have to have the words be sort of legible. You have to have the pictures have some intelligible or not relationship to the words. And everything else is a little bit up for grabs. And I would argue that everything else are almost arbitrary stylistic decisions. And there have been people who kind of created a ideological framework where this particular approach was the right kind of approach, you know, classic graphic design modernists Case. like, you know, Massimo yeah, Vignelli yeah. or Rudy de Herrick or, you know, Jacqueline Casey or Muriel Cooper, you know, sort of like would say we've got a perfect typeface. It's called Helvetica. Let's just use that. But then you can read it just as well if it's in Gil Sands or Comic Sans or whatever else you want to put it in. It's, you can still read it. So it's not like it doesn't function. So what it's adding is this very ineffable kind of hard, almost I would argue very difficult to quantify thing that actually does have to do with taste. But that part is really critical. I, you know, every time you someone cooks a meal for you, probably they could just compose something that provided whatever the daily minimum requirement of calories and vitamins you needed to get through the day and give you like a tube of green slop and you could just kind of like gulp it down and that would satisfy you and you'd be able to go on. Instead, every culture has their own crazy thing they do with food and spices that's based on specific local experience, that's based on people being innovative and surprising, that's based on people providing nostalgia and comfort like mom used to make it. And all of them are, are not only are they legitimate, that's what makes the world go round. I mean, it's funny you bring up cooking because you once said in the kitchen, I excel at washing the dishes. The restoration of order really appeals to me. <laughs> So it made me think, you know, is design on some level for you about establishing order as someone who also loves to do the dishes and not cook? What is about this satisfaction that comes from that? Like, what does it need beyond order? And what is it, the emotional experience of developing order? Um, I do, in my personal life, I do like order. And I do have a bunch of habituated behaviors that I've kind of turned into a personal lifestyle up to a certain degree. But I think in design, this is almost, I mean, it's a cliche and it's sort of blindingly obvious, but it goes back to at least Raymond Lowy, who had this whole theory about design being a balance between newness and, you know, between satisfying on one hand people's desire for predictability and comfort on one hand and their interest in novelty and surprise and the pleasure that that gives you on the other, right? And if you only do the first, it gets boring. If you only do the second, it's like sort of unendurably chaotic. And so you sort of have to balance those two things. And so I think, for instance, if you're designing a book, there are certain expectations about, you know, how books work, you know, uh, what order of things happen in the book, how simply one navigates a book. And those are based on, you know, you can sort of say that they have demonstrable functional efficacy on one hand, but also they're just based on conventions. It's just the way we've been doing it for a long time and it's what everyone expects, right? So that's a starting point. Then you figure out, okay, if this book is about this particular subject, how do I make it signal to the people who are interested in that particular subject, this is for you? How do you signal it to people who might not be interested? Hey, you might like this. How do you take the people who know it well and do it in a way that kind of surprises them in a refreshing sort of way? And that has to do with undermining what those expectations right. are. So it's sort of order and disorder in this interplay that kind of is both easing people into the convention and then providing them with surprise and pleasure. What about this concept of order bringing some sort of longevity? You, I mean, you've been practicing for almost 40 years. Yeah. Is order a way to create an enduring 
clarity over time. Yeah, I think in graphic design, particularly order, particularly if order kind of somehow is associated with simplicity and simplicity rather than reductivism or minimalism, but just kind of simplicity tends to, you know, if all else fails, simplicity is the thing that's likely to endure, partly because if you take something that's simple, people potentially can kind of impose new meaning on it over time. And it sort of doesn't get trapped in that really looks like a logo for a flower shop in the 80s sort of thing. Instead, you could have something that just is, has a kind of almost blank open-endedness to it, like say to the Target logo, which was actually designed. It was designed by, uh, I think designed by uh, Unimark International, which was Massimo Vignelli's firm back in the 60s. There's hardly any design there at all. You know, whoever paid for it must have felt a little sheepish, you know, writing that check. It's a dot but with a circle But it looks like it, it could have been designed now. Yeah, yeah. And yet, and think about all the things they've been able to do with it over the years. And something that was more specific, someone would have gotten 10 years on and said, you know, we really need to refresh this. 20 years on, they'd sort of say, let's refresh it again. You know, and so I think that simplicity kind of helped it endure. I think there are, someone listening to this will think immediately of 10 things that are incredibly you know, Notre Dame Cathedral has endured and it ain't simple. And there's plenty of things that don't have that simplicity that still have the power to move people decades, centuries later. So it's not a hard and fast rule. It also has to do with sort of something being resolved, doesn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. like Notre Dame is, is resolved Yeah, as a form. So what is worthy of your time in these times? Uh, in terms of design, you know, as well as your energy, your attention. I mean, we're in a weird moment uh, with the whole practice, the whole discipline of branding. So when you're looking at something now in your station, how do you feel like this is worthy of me? Without a sort of hubristic approach, just like you could do anything. Yeah, the question invites hubris. And um, and I, um, I went through most of my life just saying yes to everything, sort of assuming that there were no bad jobs, there were no unpromising projects, you know, there were no bad clients even, you know, that just saying yes to everything is it. And I'm I'm also one of those people who, you know, the reason I didn't become an artist, despite the fact that I was besotted at the museum in Cleveland was, I just couldn't figure out what would compel people just to go off and make those paintings without a deadline, without you know, over and over again. I didn't get why people would do that, you know? Whereas, you know, like so many people my age, you look at an album cover and you think, boy, you know, to be sitting around while the Beatles were making Revolver and to be named Klaus Vorman and to sort of say, hey, could you do some artwork for the cover and have your name on the cover, just like John Paul George Ringo's name is on the cover? That I understood. What I found exciting about that was the fact that graphic design particularly, design in general, but graphic design specifically, is a very social activity. You know, you're mediating between different groups of people. And I think the only thing that I've tried to do to answer your question is uh, I've tried to situate myself with people that I find interesting that I actually think I can learn from, even at my advanced age, people where I think I sort of admire what they're doing, or I think I can support it in a way that corresponds to what talents I have. If you get more critical about that, you will tend to start saying no to things. No to some things that actually are potentially really interesting and fun and remunerative, but you just sort of think, I'm not sure I want to you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's a room I want to keep going back to and talking right. this thing through. So, so there's no sort of personal math. You're not one of these kind of. Well, it needs to hit these criteria, and then I know I can do it. No, no. I, I mean, I still, when in doubt, I tend to say yes. And part of it is, I tend to find like lots of different things really interesting. I know really good designers who end up in a way specializing just because they really love fashion. They like moving in those circles. They mastered that vocabulary. They, then it becomes a circle, either vicious or virtuous that ends up being self-reflexive and reinforcing. And you end up doing a lot of fashion work. You're called to do more fashion work. And then if you like that world, that's great. I mean, I've dipped into that world, but I've also dipped into the world of professional sports, something that I kind of have almost no 
seemingly no uh no genetic disposition to be interested in but it's like interesting to do i've I, you know i've been in you know universities with really smart people i've been in newsrooms you know and it's you sort of get to be a spy in all these different environments and i think if you like that you end up doing a lot of a lot of different things seem interesting yeah you once said my favorite cartoon character is wiley coyote <laughs> yes. why well, if you think about it, he actually is a real, he's like the the ultimate early adapter, right? I mean, he's sort of just really enthusiastic about the latest Acme product, really intrigued by, you know, the fact that these rocket-powered shoes or this portable um, rocket launcher will really work. Let's give this thing a try. And then, and then he also has this real optimism, you know, despite the fact that um, it's never worked in the past, he still thinks, by golly, next time I think it might just work. And I, I've revealed my this dirty secret many times. So it's it's not really a secret, but when I get rejected, you know, if I I can have a really good idea and kind of enthusiastically try to persuade a client to accept and then go out and execute it, then sometimes they do, but sometimes they reject it. I actually find the rejections, like everyone at the beginning, I used to find them really uh, depressing and sometimes they'd make me angry. And now I just kind of find them an exciting challenge in a way. It's sort of like, you know, it's like you dare me to find, uh, to come back with like version number 17 of this thing. I'd give you 17 and 18, two for one next time around, you know? And then sometimes the 18th one is the best one. Sometimes the 18th one sends you back to uh, number one. And that's sort of, I think, is that Wiley Coyote, you know, next time it's going to work. And also brand loyalty you're impressed by. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, lo- yeah, that's right. He's sort of like, you know, it's the name he trusts, oddly enough, despite all, you know. So I was wondering, is brand loyalty something you think about? Is this like a desire of yours when you're making the work that you want that as an outcome? Do you think about the audience in that way? Um, well, I think having taught a little bit in business schools and heard other really smart professors describe what the mechanics of brand loyalty are, the ultimate kind of brand loyalty is something where your loyalty, your affiliation, your personal affiliation with the brand is such that if they just put that name on something you had never tried, you would try it because you assume it was good. I think Wiley Coyote and Acme sort of seems to have that alchemy happening. But I think by the same token, I think to go to everyone's favorite go-to subject, I think Apple is then, you know, if, if Apple announced that starting a year from... November, they were going to launch something called Apple Car. They would probably sell how many sight unseen people would say, how can I sign up to get an Apple Car? Despite the fact that in theory, there's nothing that you own by Apple that would demonstrate their specific ability to do a car. People just think, well, I mean, if it if that works as good as my uh, my ear pods, you know, it's got to be great. Right. And so that's ultimate brand loyalty. But I think it also transfers over to um one of my early clients at, uh, when I joined Pentagram was uh, the um, Brooklyn Academy of Music. And BAM has this sort of thing where they can sort of announce that in the Next Wave Festival, they're having these performances. And they can actually sound almost like borderline preposterous. Like, we dare you to come see this. And yet, there's a certain part of the cultural consuming population who have come to trust them to deliver a sort of this sounds weird, reliably avant-garde sort of a uh, product, even if it's like it's Hamlet, except it's performed by animals, except it's nine hours long and it's in Sanskrit. Interested? And people say, yeah, I don't want to miss this, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so I think that that sort of, again, is another form of brand loyalty. So to a degree, it actually it helps people navigate through their lives. I think yeah. it actually can be powerful. Are there moments in your career where you recognize that design and brand were actually really consequential? Well, if you work on a presidential election, you sort of see that uh, writ large and with with real consequences. And in fact, for years, my, uh, you know, if I was teaching a class, I'd have an example that now is ancient history, the 2000 election between uh, Al Gore and George W. Bush, which really arguably came down to a very boring piece of information graphics in Palm Beach County, Florida, where someone had the task of laying out a ballot 
sort of had the same problem that I've had a million times in my career, which is someone gives you too much stuff to fit in too little space and you've got to figure out some way to do it. And um, the person who laid out that ballot just decided they would arrange the, the candidates and the corresponding holes that had to be punched to indicate which candidate you wanted in this kind of back and forth way on what became known as the butterfly ballot so that some people argue hundreds of people who meant to cast a vote for Al Gore inadvertently voted for another candidate, a third party candidate, Pat Buchanan. And so George Bush ended up taking that county and that county was the tipping point for the state of Florida. Florida was the tipping point for the whole country. And so there you have it. And that was just literally the dopiest kind of graphic design. It was like literally just here, lay out this one call, government work, lay out this form. It ain't about being pretty. You're not trying to persuade people to kind of like vote. For, you're not trying to persuade people to buy this ballot instead of the other less pretty ballot. You only get one ballot. It just has to do with job. No one did a standards manual. No, 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 didn't quite. <laughs> and, you know, in fact, it, I mean, there should be a standards manual for those things. You shouldn't have to go in and I mean, like the way that we actually run elections in this country, as has been demonstrated <laughs> since, yeah. has lots of interesting design flaws. 16 years later, I um. I was involved with Hillary Clinton's campaign, which was really, really exciting. Did there's a lot there. Yeah. And ended up doing the logo that was um, enthusiastically received by her supporters, reviled by uh, or made fun of by people who didn't like her. So it's sort of it was interesting to sort of see a symbol actually functioning almost the way a symbol is designed to function, where it's actually just the shorthand for the thing it represents. And up against a candidate who actually seemingly didn't have any design ethos, graphic design ethos in his strong uh, brand by the end. Yeah. But actually a, you know, when you think about it, what is he other than a brand? You know, his his whole fortune was predicated on selling his five letter name to stakes and universities and neckties and ultimately a uh, political party and ultimately a uh, country, red hats. you know? Yeah. And red hats, you know, <laughs> and uh, the difference between a logo and a brand, I think got really demonstrated by that. So, and again, I sort of like look back and I, I, I'm not sure I would have done anything differently. I was never, you know, I'm not a presidential advisor and I just was happy, really happy to make a contribution to someone who I really thought would have made a really, really good president and who those few occasions I spent time with her, I had that impact of one-on-one -on -one conversation where you really got to see Secretary Clinton's, you know, intelligence and vision and ability to connect with people. But that's different than a, you know, a brand that has to be legible to millions in a way. And a logo doesn't make it so, a typeface doesn't make it so. There has to be this combination of personality and expression in a way that all has to feel like it has this inherent authenticity every you know, time you see it yeah as is demonstrated it's not about consistency because yeah. uh trump is one of the most maddeningly inconsistent people in you know in public life you know and sort but of he's consistently that he's consistently that and there's some underlying consistency that he's satisfying in people that the people who resonate to that kind of find really addictive in a way you know so and keep coming back for more I wanted to go back a little bit, along with some others, you started a website called Design Observer, a mm -hmm. very well-loved website. You made a book out of it. Yeah. What was the world like at the moment that you started that, and why did you start it? Well, I actually remember very specifically what it was like to write the first thing I wrote for Design Observer, which was a blog in the age of blogs, 20 years old now, uh, and there wasn't really a blog that seemed to be talking about design as design, particularly des not design as not as design as a shopping guide to kind of buy housewares or things, but actually just kind of like thinking about design as it related to things like culture or politics or sports or anything. And uh, me, the late Bill Drentel, Jessica Hilf and Rick Pointer decided that we just would jointly start contributing to this uh, to this platform called the Design Observer. And there was no editor in chief, no one did assignments, no one fielded pitches, which we got no pitches anyway, so that wasn't necessary. Each of us would just write something and we all sort of knew the protocol of how to press publish on uh, whatever we were using back then. Movable type was the platform we were using at the beginning back then. You know, I remember having written some things that ran in old print media 
you'd write something, send it to the editor. And you know, I, I worked with editors I really like, including Rick, who was a co-founder of Design Observer. But you, you know, you'd send something to be published in print magazine or I magazine in my field and a few months later be published. And then you might run into an occasional person who would say, I saw that thing you wrote. And then a few issues later, someone might write a letter saying, uh, to the publisher, I must subject to, you know, the points that Mr. Beirut made in his issue dated, you know, and you're thinking, well, that happened seven months ago, you know, where I don't even agree with me. Anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so all of a sudden this thing called blogs kind of gave this really fun publish immediately feedback immediately loop. That was really great. But I remember the very first article I wrote and I sort of, I gave myself a remit. We didn't, you know, there was no editor so we could write about whatever we wanted. I remember thinking, I just want to make graphic design something that people might find fun to talk about. And at that point, no, like, I would tell people as a graphic designer and to the degree they were interested, well, if they politely asked what that meant, I'd tell them and I could see they got bored immediately. You know, like it just seemed to be that I was like talking about some sort of, you know, hopeless esoterica that bore no relationship to anyone's lives. Right. But I decided like, why don't I write this as if this stuff is interesting and important or funny or things like that. And I remember the New York Times had just changed their basic typographic menu which had been a little bit chaotic up until about 20 years ago. They were mixing Latin Extended and uh, Franklin Gothic and all these different typefaces. And they sort of went to this typeface called Sheltonham, which if you get the print edition or indeed the online edition, all those headlines are in versions of a typeface called Sheltonham that I think have been remastered by uh, the brilliant eminence Greece of typography, Matthew Carter, just for the times. And so they replaced all their headline fonts with this single headline font. And I wrote an article about that. And in fact, I wrote it and I sort of quoted from some letters they got in response. And I, I thought it was funny because they were sort of saying, we're making this great leap into the future, courtesy of a typeface designed in 1896 or something. So I thought there was something kind of funny about that. But I, I forget how I like, I went out for like 600 words on this subject. But I remember that I wrote it probably a week and a half after they did it. And I sort of thought, I'll get around to writing this. And I sort of saved the issues and I saved the print issue that had the letters. And I saved the little editor's note that said, you may notice something different. And I wrote a fairly arch thing that I thought was funny and made it sound interesting. And I think we had hardly any readers back then. So some people read it and one or two people commented on it. But if that happened today, Slate, the intelligence or of New York Magazine, you know, podcasters, you know, people would just go all over it and sort of like, what does it mean? You know, like everything, nothing escapes scrutiny now, you yeah. know? You know, I used to literally tell clients, don't bother putting out a press release about your new logo because no one cares. Yeah. Like it's the most, we, you know, stop the presses for immediate release. We have a new logo, behold. You know, like, like who cares? No one cares. Yeah. And then, you know, um, Fast forward 20 years or so, and suddenly- uh, oh, It's a big public conversation. Yeah, it's now. a big public conversation. And like, to a degree that would have like, that I that I actually, you know, in a way it's what I always wanted. Everyone talking about logos. Everyone talking about logos I designed. And secretly part of me sort of likes it. I've done logos that were really reviled for different reasons. And I don't take it personally when people criticize it. I think if you want people to notice and talk about these things, people are going to not, you know, just like anything else. Some people will like them. Some people won't. It's just part of being in the public eye to a certain degree. Well, it was interesting because you guys really started that. I mean, there was one piece in particular called Innovation is the New Black, yeah, which yeah. I went back and, and read before this. And you kind of focus on the business world's need to frame trend, that you understand that design, capital D, sounds cosmetic and ephemeral, and innovation sounds energetic and essential. It made me think about how it was very projective because it was at a moment where it was innovation at all costs. Yeah. This is where things started to really speed up. You know, you also mentioned Eames said sort of innovate as a last resort. Yeah, you, were, yeah. you were kind of pulling things back. Dalai Lama said there's too much passion, not enough compassion. Like there's <laughs> yeah, all these yeah, things yeah, around yeah. this idea. But where do you sit on this now after having seen the sort of outcome of extraordinary innovation at all costs over the last 17 years since you wrote that? Well, I think, Andrew, this, it's an interesting question of whether or not, when I wrote that piece, it was like, as you observed, it was much less about is innovation good or bad, but it was just more about the vocabulary of people writing and describing business 
activities and the kind of words that editors use to describe things uh, to make them sound more appealing or more interesting. And I think innovation was replaced with or concurrent with entrepreneurship, let's say, you know, and now if you, I kind of like listen when I'm in meetings now and now people, people don't talk about innovation that much, but they will talk about like inclusion and accessibility more. Yeah. And I think to a certain degree with the same amount of, of kind of low stakes sincerity, you know, <laughs> they, they want to check those boxes and yeah. this is something they don't want to be against necessarily, but as long as it doesn't mess up things too much we want to you know what i mean so and th thus it also was with innovation people were all in favor of innovation except then you would test things and find again you were being kind of strung between those two poles of what is comfortable habituation on one end and what's just different enough to be interesting on the other and raw innovation for its own sake fell off that cliff on the on the new side too much you know and so People will say, we've all decided what kind of a, uh, what a website should look like, what a retail website should look like, what a shopping experience should feel like online. There's been many comical observations made about fashion brands all sort of moving towards this deadpan, all capital letter, sans serif kind of um, blankness and shedding the idiosyncrasies that they had in the past and what does that mean? So, and each one of those things individually represents some sort of innovation, but it's also kind of a regression to a some sort of great yeah. mean of homogeny out there, right? Yeah. But that homogeny then creates the next platform against which you can do a kind of innovation of a new right. sort, I suppose. When I read it, I thought, wow, this was right before innovation kind of reared its ugly head yeah, in many yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, the yeah. very beginning. And, and you know, and, and Andrew, I swear, I remember going to a meeting back in the 90s where someone, someone, they, they had, my client had called in a consultant who really was an expert on something that didn't even quite have a name, but it was described in terms of how automation, I, like the words artificial intelligence wasn't used, but sort of computers would enable commercial entities to anticipate people's needs and sort of do this thing called mass customization. So that for instance, instead of just subscribing to a publication, it would learn that you're really interested in these subjects, right? And then it would serve up just the subjects you're most interested in, right? And, or even if it would find out a whole lot of things about you. So if you checked into a hotel and the last time you were there, you drank only Diet Coke, it would see to it that you're mini fridge was stocked with nothing but Diet Coke. Everyone in the room heard that and thought, that's great. Wow. You know, <laughs> it, how fast can we make this exciting new future arrive, right? And of course, the first thing I describe ends up contributing and being the defining trait of the polarized kind of echo chambers that define political and cultural discourse today. The second thing has to do with the creepiness of privacy where I don't want people to know that I drink only Diet Coke. And what else do they know? And of course, they know a lot of other things too. Tons and tons and tons and tons of other things, right? And it's about how much are you willing to, you know, and I swear though, faced with that promise of innovation in that room in about 1998, not a single person sort of like said, but isn't that kind of creepy invasion of privacy? Wouldn't that lead to kind of like echo chamber polarization? It was just like, bring it on, man. The miracle of technology. We like perverse incentives too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just what we like. <laughs> so you have a commitment to your notebooks. I know I'm popping around a little bit here, but you have these sort of marbled composition yeah, yeah, yeah. notebooks. You've kept them forever. What have you learned in keeping these books? Why are you so rigorously committed to this practice? Well, these notebooks, when people see them, and I think I'm on 137 now, and they go all the way back to 1982. For one thing, I, I just remember things better if I write them down. So when people see them, they're not, they're not exciting. They're not filled with all these sketches that are just kind of, kind of, coming out of my brain nonstop that I have to somehow commit to paper. It's just like lists of words the names of people who are at a table I'm sitting at, who I tend to kind of get confused about and forget sometimes. Sometimes I'll draw a little diagram that sort of helps me understand the relationship of the things that are being described, helps me kind of visualize it and kind of get it locked in my mind a little bit. And then it's like, you know, notes on a phone call or now a Zoom call and things like that. And so it helps me remember, it helps me kind of focus that I'm a visual person. It's just even seeing it in words on a page, even words, not pictures, helps me sort of like think more clearly about it. 
there's a funny unintended byproduct where if I happen to look at notebook number 76 or something, which would be maybe, you know, maybe the late 90s or something, it actually helps you put everything in perspective because um, these things that were really important at that moment in my life, you know, things I was afraid of, you know, some client I was afraid was going to get mad at me, some deadline that if I didn't make it, the world was going to end. You just realize, you know, who was that person anyway? Whatever happened to them, you know? And I guess I, I, I just uh, was listening to a podcast about the film Barry Lyndon, which has at the end this little coda saying, all of the people described here, whether they were rich or poor, whether they were acclaimed or reviled, successful or unsuccessful, they're all dead now. You know, and, and like sort of, and you really realize that like um, everything sort of recedes in memory and then just ends up making a kind of contribution to what your experience is. And so it helps you keep things in perspective when I go back and I look at the way those things were in the past. And every once in a while, I can sort of like say, at the same time, I'll find occasionally the first mention where I was like saying, spell that again. And I was writing down the name of someone who actually would be a friend of mine. You know who I'm still friends with today, and um, so they're a portal in a way. Yeah, they're yeah, they help yeah. You a little feel bit of time traveling. Yeah, where'd you grow up? I grew up in suburban Cleveland, um, in Parma, Ohio. I was actually born in Garfield Heights, Ohio, then moved to Parma, which is a little bit newer and shinier. Not the Parma of Italy. I had no From idea. There, I had no. I didn't have the. <laughs> I didn't have the faintest idea there was a Parma, Italy, uh, when I was living, and nor did most people in Parma, Ohio. It was then the ninth biggest city in Ohio, I believe, the biggest. Certainly the biggest city in Ohio that voted for Trump as a city. You know, once the cities get bigger, they get more urban and then and, and probably more diverse and uh, and sort of go more Democrat. At least they did then. Kind of just a suburb in the middle of nowhere, I was describing. Did your parents work? Yeah. No, my mom was a housewife, but she had been a... Um, a secretary, knew stenography, uh, went to kind of like a business school to learn how to be a useful 50s secretary. And she was, a, I think, a, by all accounts, a fantastic one. You know, this overqualified, really brainy woman who kind of was just biding time before she married my dad. Then she became a homemaker and a mom, raised me and my two brothers. My dad sold printing equipment for a living, sold like printing presses, which for a long time I sort of thought, yeah, my dad did this thing that has no relation to what I do. Of course, it's on multiple levels that it directly relates to what I do. And, and how him, much time have you spent in front of a Heidelberg? Um, you know, what's really funny is every time I've been invited to stand in front of a Heidelberg, I usually will say to the personnel that are manning that machine, something like, um, you know, and, and graphic designers used to, less now, but uh, used to like go on things called press checks, where if you design something that's being printed, you were expected to stand alongside the printing press and watch it and approve it as it was coming off the press. I never had that much of an appetite for this, actually, and I'm not sure I was that good at it because I, I always worry about my attention to detail and people brooding about this color being a little too warm, a little too cool, and I'm like, Boring. yeah, I mean, it's like, it's it's red, right? I, you know, I want it to be red. That looks red. <laughs> Let's just move on. So, God forgive me, there's a million designers just freaked out, but that's me. But I remember I standing in front of Heidelberg, a lot of times I just would idly say, Oh, yeah, my dad used to sell these back in Ohio. And then I sort of would all of a sudden, you know, people would look at me like, hmm, those, the, you know, the press men and press people would sort of like be, aha, uh -huh, you know, maybe this guy knows something. I knew nothing about it, you know. I sort of just knew enough to sort of like get the basic principles. But it was, ironically, your dad who kind of introduced you to what design was. Yeah, and became that perfect combination of a someone who knew just enough about what I did for a living, but that he could be enthusiastic about it. Not so much that he would critique my work to the degree that my professors and classmates and colleagues and bosses later would. But he pointed you towards the first logo. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he was. My dad was actually someone who took a lot of pleasure. I realize that now just thinking this morning, actually, uh, how much pleasure he took in visual culture. He was a real movie buff in a period, you know, pre doesn't have to be said, but pre-Netflix, pre-YouTube, where if you were interested in movies, it was like really combing through television schedules for late night movies or going to repertory theaters or things like that. He liked that. He knew movies really well. And he um, and he he liked the visual parts of movies. He would kind of nudge me and say, watch what happens now. You know, pay attention to the left hand side of the screen. He loved that sort of thing. And the same token, he 
pointed out the first logo I registered as a logo, which I've, uh, which was a logo for the Clark forklift truck company. And if you know that logo, um, some people do and some people don't, but it's got a simple trick to it, which is that the, uh, and I looked at it, he said, look at that Clark logo. I always liked that. It's clever. And I looked at it, just said C-L-A-R-K. And I looked at it and like, why is that clever? Um, and, and he said, well, look how the, the L kind of goes underneath the one leg of the A and kind of lifts it up just like a forklift truck. And I was thunderstruck by this. I just thought someone had just embedded a magic trick in plain sight. I often think that that was the moment I decided that that was like the highest artistic calling that I wanted to strive for. It's just, a, you know, not magic. Yeah, not park it in a museum, but just put it on a construction site where a million people would just get one little moment of joy and pleasure out of seeing this thing without having to pay an admission fee or take an art history class or anything. Just a little visual thing that would just kind of you know, a little bit of joy where previously there was none. There was, and I remember thinking, how does one do this for a living? And, you know, I couldn't figure out what the job was. How does one inject was. meaning into letters? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is great. Um, <laughs> you've also talked about and written about your first public work was this poster at school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason I wanted to bring that up, even though you've spoken about it before, is I'm curious what it felt like for you because you've had many moments of adoration and validation in your career, and this maybe was the first. Yeah. Has it changed? Do you still get the same feeling you got then? Yeah, and I'd point out the feeling is not acclaim or adoration or anything. Because I To back up in case someone doesn't know the story, you made a poster for the school play. Yeah, the school play. It was uh, ninth grade, 1972. The play was Wait Until Dark. Great play, by the way. One that my dad loved. You know that play? No. You know, the, the movie is a great movie. And the, the gimmick is that a bunch of like scary criminals are threatening a helpless woman who's blind. I think played maybe by Audrey Hepburn in the movie. And I remember that I forget who the bad guys were really great kind of thugs. And I forget I what like. she's got in her house that they want to get. And she realizes it's a little like sorry, wrong number thing where she's helpless and sort of the whole drama is. How is she going to protect herself? It, particularly because she's blind and helpless and groping her way around. In Act 3, the bad guys are on the way. And she has this brilliant thing where she breaks all the lights in the house. So the house is completely dark. So she'll have the, uh, the, the upper, upper hand. hand. Exactly. And so I'm sitting watching this with my dad. And my dad says, watch. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. And, okay, spoiler alert. Fast forward if you want to enjoy this movie. What happens next? This is the big spoiler. Is that uh, one of the bad guys kind of like feels his way into the kitchen, feels his way over the refrigerator and just slowly opens the refrigerator door because she forgot about the light in the refrigerator. And I still remember my dad saying, she forgot about the refrigerator. <laughs> and I don't even remember what, she survives, bad guys are vanquished somehow, but I, that, I'm getting goosebumps describing that moment. And what's interesting is that it's like, purely visual you know the protagonist is it's about sight and what you can see and what you can't see oh my god it's so good at any rate it started as a stage play we put it on in junior high school and i um i had a little bit of stage fright and questionable personal charisma and popularity that i didn't really i couldn't like make the tryouts to be actually on the stage but they said hey barut you know you're good at art can you do a poster for this thing and so um I didn't even know where, you know, no tie. I like hand lettered the whole thing. I did it with like a bell tip pen and a piece of cardboard I had. My school had a big vocational program that actually involved the printing trades. My dad had sold them some of the printing presses they had in the basement, but they were going to silk screen this poster and mass produce it. And uh, I think I turned it in on a Friday and showed up for school on Monday. And that poster was everywhere. It was like on every hallway, you know, next to the lockers, in the stairwells. And it just said, wait until dark. November 17th and 18th, $1 Normandy High School presents or something. So, uh, and I remember just being elect, you know, and, and I, you know, I think that if there's anyone, I would suggest that this is a universal motivating thing for designers. When you see your work out there in the world, it's not about people saying, wait a second, find the guy that did that wait until dark poster. I have to meet him. I don't care about that. It's just that it's there and people are looking at it. And not only, you know, I got to go to the cast party, hang out with the cool kids who were in drama. That's how uncool I was. I thought the cool kids were in the <laughs> drama club. Okay. So that sort of says a lot. 
but still, you know, it, there was this social component that I really enjoyed, you know, that I that I got to sort of engage with the content of the play, but yet wasn't actually in the play. But just the idea of inserting something into the world and sort of seeing it living in the world amongst all these unsuspecting people. You know, if I would have said, hey, you know, some kid would have threatened to punch me for my milk money, I would have said, hey, I, didn't you see that poster I did for Wait Until Dark? He would have said, what the fuck are you talking about? And, and, <laughs> and how different it? is you know? it when you put 2.3 billion credit cards oh, in the yeah, world no, no, with your logo? No, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it sort of is. I mean, I can remember I did... Like I designed the sign that's on the New York Times building with my team at Pentagram. And I still remember we had done a test of it out in New Jersey where Renzo Piano and FX Fowl, the uh, executive architects, had kind of like built this big test facade because we wanted to just make sure how it would read with light behind it, how it would read at sunset. So we went out to New Jersey, built this thing that must have been about 20 by 20 feet, hoisted it up with a thing and sort of we could sort of, you know, we sort of said, yeah, it's going to work because the sign itself is made up of all these individual pieces that actually it's not a solid sign. It's a, it's a Venetian blind. It's that like makes a Venetian a sign. blind, exactly, yeah. on a building that has top to bottom Venetian blind, in a sense, architectural elements on it. And um, um, and it's like I, beauty facing ugly, too, yeah, in its position yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in New York. One, yeah, it's one doesn't amazing. want to obscure the view to the Port Authority building <laughs> exactly. across the street. But I remember being on, I, I love public transportation. For some reason, I was on the bus going up 8th Avenue. And I remember thinking, oh, I think, you know, they, weren't they supposed to install the sign this week? And I remember I switched from the left-hand side of the bus to the right-hand side of the bus and kind of craned my head out the window. And holy cow, it was half up. And I almost like started screaming. And believe me, there wasn't a single person that bus would have had any idea what I was going off about. Like, even though I said I, quote unquote, designed that sign, it's sort of like, that's the logo from the New York Times. And now it's on a building. Well, well done, sir, whoever you are now, <laughs> please go back in your seat, and try to control yourself. You know, I mean, like, you know, it's something where I don't think anyone really it's an esoteric thing that no one's going to be impressed by in terms of the architectural feat that it took. But just to have something that visible where there was previously it wasn't there. It's just like the Clark logo. Yeah. It's like, you know. I would see someone with the Saks Fifth Avenue shopping bag. The first time I saw some, like a civilian, someone I hadn't met holding a Saks Fifth Avenue shopping bag I designed, I almost like I was in a restaurant. And I, oh, I like, I was facing the door. My wife was facing me. And I remember she, all of a sudden this look at me. She said, what's wrong? And I said, that woman over there, <laughs> she's carrying a sax bag. And and, and, and and Dorothy, at least, I've been I've been married a long time, and I was dating her all the way back to not quite wait until dark days, but shortly thereafter in high school. And so she sort of like knew what was going on, kind of rolled her eyes a little bit and says, yeah, it looks nice. So uh, she sort of like was not really, but like, it's just exciting to sort of see these things. And meanwhile, she, I remember her mom Bought either they bought her mom a gift at Saks or her mom had been at Saks and Dorothy said, you know, Mike designed those bags and she looked at it and there's no, you know, it just was this typographic thing that I did. So there's no drawing of a woman wearing a coat and no drawings of flowers or anything. It was, in fact, it was a little bit black and white. It was sort of reductive. You can tell she had no idea like what operations I had actually performed that enabled me to claim I had anything to do with making this shopping bag come into existence. And so she just nodded pleasantly and said, that's nice, Mike. It's nice. So you've been married to Dorothy for over 40 years. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And she was the first and only girl you ever kissed. First and only girl I ever kissed. Yeah. And I know that's a funny question, but what do you think makes that kind of relationship work? I know you feel just lucky. Yeah. 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 You know, but what makes it work that long? Oh, I don't know. There's lots of books and movies on that subject, I suppose. You know, what? where does love yeah, come but what from? What makes and, your relationship yeah. with Dorothy? Um, I would say that um, people who know us and see us together, we're not kind of visibly besotted by each other. You know, we're not dreamily staring at each other's eyes. In fact, we argue a lot. We sort of, Dorothy's sort of is, you know, as I just said, kind of like not, like a, she's not a, like a trophy wife who kind of met me when I was successful or would have met me when I was older, at least, and sort of thinks that I'm impressive. She knew me when I was um, pimply, basically, back in high school and um, knew me before any of this happened. She's very honest. I think I have trouble reading people sometimes. And I remember I'd be thrown into a bunch of 14-year-old, uh, 15-year-old girls and just be completely kind of bewildered by 
the faces they were making and the whispers they were sharing and if they were giggling, were they laughing with me, laughing at me? And I tend that all of that tended to acerbate my own awkwardness and made me feel more kind of estranged from those girls and probably society and perhaps reality, uh, which isn't a good look. But Dorothy is one of these people who sort of is completely consistent, behaves the same way, regardless of whether she's talking to someone important, whether she's talking to our grandchildren. She'll sort of, she has the same sort of straightforward thing. And I just found that so, even when we have fights and she'll tell me something really uh, difficult for her to say about something, about a problem she has with me or my behavior. I'm almost so grateful that she's honest with me. She just comes out and tells me these things. And so that's what I get out of her. What she gets out of me maybe is, I don't know, it must be some complimentary thing that actually works the opposite direction. She thinks that I'm funny, I think, and, you know, interesting. And we've we've gotten into some interesting adventures together as a result of our of what both of us are enthusiastic about. And so I think we've just kind of managed to go through Seems things. Seems like there's just such deep respect. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. I haven't heard one interview with you where she wasn't mentioned. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah. Which is interesting. You know, it's every time it somehow has come up as a kind of not anchor, but something that allows you to both be humble yeah. and remain grounded. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, that's definitely true. I'm kind of, I have our three kids, none of the three of them, none of the three of them became graphic designers for sure. Uh, my son is in video, which is sort of a creative visual thing, but his big sister is a lawyer. His younger sister is in ecology and wildlife management. And I'm really excited and proud by that. I mean, I can sit with, Liz and talk about law cases. <laughs> I really find them interesting. I've been on safari with Martha in, you know, in Uganda where she spent a lot of time and that's fascinating. And, and I can talk about video with my son. It's the same thing that makes me interested in graphic design. The fact that it's about all these other things is really fascinating. I think you may be right, Andrew. It really does start with that fundamental relationship that I have with Dorothy. I think if she did what I did, I'd be much less interested in, say, writing that article explaining why it's so funny that the New York Times is using this typeface called Sheldonham, because I would just assume, well, if you don't know, you know, all the cool people know that it's Sheldonham, you know, but instead, right. I just would say to Dorothy, oh my God, the New York Times changed his typeface. And she would just roll her eyes and say, uh, um, why is that important? And I, then I would explain it to her. And she would and she would say, that sounds like a fun fact, you know? My starting point is that people aren't necessarily waiting to clap for what I do or interested in everything I say or dying to see the next thing I design. That starts with Dorothy, God bless her. Hey everyone, taking a quick break here to tell you a little bit about our season six sponsor, Le Cole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. Celebrating its 10th anniversary this year, Le Cole brings together teachers, jewelers, art historians, gemologists, designers, lacquer masters, enamelers, setters, lapidaries, mock-up makers, and others to share their passion and knowledge of jewelry with the world. Through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications, Lacole makes the world of jewelry accessible to all. No matter one's experience level, Lacole opens up an incredible art form that has long been reserved for a handful of people. Through a fresh, pioneering approach, Lacole sits at the crossroads of art, gemology, and craftsmanship, and contributes to and consolidates knowledge around the fascinating, vast world of jewelry. You can learn more about LeCole and its current and upcoming offerings at www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And now back to the episode. So you meet her in high school and a number of other things occur in high school that lead you to now. And one of them is that you, in 1974, come to New York and you encounter a subway poster. Yep, yep. We had a field trip to uh, to New York. That was like actually a really consequential field trip because um, Dorothy and I were friends, were platonic friends. Friends, uh, she had friend zoned in me really resolutely, and had, I think she thought that she had that under control. But I sort of 
you know, I don't think I've ever put it this way in this, you know, recorded context like a podcast, but I think uh, it was a, b- a long bus ride from uh, Ohio to New York City. It was like a culture trip for the art kids and the drama club kids and the band kids. We we're going to go see musicals and museums and stuff like that. And Dorothy and I just started necking on that bus and like we just started kissing and it was just sort of like the most transporting experience I'd ever had. We, you know, so icky for my adult children now hearing this, I suppose, but hey, that's what happened. But I remember, so that was the same trip. February 20th, 1974 was the exact date that that specific thing transpired. But I uh, got to New York. And so I was actually in this, I mean, I was besotted then. I was like in love. And then I got to New York and I sort of felt like I had been watching the shadows on the walls of the cave for my entire life back in Ohio. Now suddenly I had emerged and I was looking directly into the sun of New York in, by the way, 1974. And um, dark times, very dark times. And we were staying at a hotel called the, uh, the Royal Manhattan, which eventually became the Milford Plaza. So it was on 8th Avenue, up the street from where the New York Times was then and further up from where it is now. But uh, 8th Avenue, which, you know, overlooking Show World, the big porno place, prostitutes all over the street, filthy garbage, graffiti. And I just thought, this is the most wonderful place I've ever been in my entire life. I just loved it. I was just thrilled. The sense that there was excitement and danger. Went to MoMA and then you kind of like stumble out of this trashy dump of a town. And you go into the Museum of Modern Art and you're standing in front of the water lilies. Uh, you're standing in front of, of Monet. And the fact that in those days, you know, you sort of could have MoMA to yourself at the right time of day. At the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, in yeah. these little intimate rooms. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, people yeah. Was, don't remember necessarily that the MoMA was about intimate engagements yeah, yeah, yeah. with one painting. Yeah, exactly. It was beautiful. And then, you know, we saw um, we saw Pippin. We saw uh, that championship season. We saw Little Night Music. And so we saw these great shows. We did all this great stuff. But, like, I remember um, we were encouraged to ride the subway. <laughs> like, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't think any, had anyone not seen, like, you know, like mean, death, streets. Yeah, mean streets or <laughs> death wish or whatever, you know, it's sort of like, it's like, Hey, where's New York. So we're in the subways. And I remember they, um, they gave you a map when you buy a token and you get a free map. I got this map and the map was, um, I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And it was the then fairly new, I think designed just in 1972 geometric abstraction subway map that uh, Massimo Vignelli had designed. So I saved it, and in fact, I believe it was the only souvenir I brought home from my trip to New York, and I hung it in my bedroom back at 4161 Sarasota Drive in Parma, Ohio, and like that talisman kind of sat there. And what was interesting was it both represented New York to me, and it represented this thing that even at that point I hadn't quite called graphic design or didn't quite apprehend was a kind of graphic design that I might do at one point. But it definitely was a graphic designer's translation of what New York was all about. And so, um, and, and I had no idea that the design had anything to do with a living person named Massimo Vignelli, who I'd later worked for. And I had no idea that I'd eventually, I think I would had decided I've got to go back to New York and go there. But I sort of had no idea that that, that would sort of be a... Um, How did you meet him? By the time I was in college, in, in a program that was uh, at the University of Cincinnati, in their College of Design, they had a graphic design department teaching very, very sophisticated graphic design with really good professors. It was maybe the golden age of kind of state education. So with for very little tuition, I was getting a, a million-dollar graphic design education. Uh, they had a mandatory work-study program where you'd work in different places. I had this great job working for... Uh, WGBH TV up in Boston in their design department, which was, again, it was one of those things where made great wasn't just the fact that there were great designers there and there were great designers there. But it was also the subject matter was Julia Child and the yeah. new documentary they'd done about Vietnam, all this really interesting stuff. That it's like used, the heyday of Yeah, it was the heyday of public television. Masterpiece Theater was a new thing then. And GBH up in Boston was originating so much programming that they needed teacher guides and promotion and all this other stuff. So it just, I just felt like so happy up there, but it was Boston, not New York. And a friend of mine, uh, I had a job in New York and I remember that I made a trip, I think towards the end of my internship where I spent like three days just kind of visiting places. I, you know, I just would call up places and say, Hey, um, can I come by and show you my portfolio? 
And uh, sometimes they would say, could you just drop it off? Sometimes they'd actually look at it while you waited. And this is like a big thing about, you know, 42 inches wide by 36 inches tall with a handle on it. You'd haul it around like a uh, like a suitcase. Awful. And yeah, it was like with big plastic sheets that had Especially your work. Especially if you're in one. San Francisco trying to get work. Yeah, yeah. No, it was like, <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Uh, but something amazing about it, too, and the fact that it was all just based on a piece of paper with phone numbers, a pocket full of coins, so you could use the pay phone and say, could I see you today at 2? And as it turned out, I um, one of the names I had on my list was this firm called Vignelli Associates. And I had it, I thought I had an in there. I wasn't much of a networker, but I had the luck of uh, working with someone up in Boston who had been a classmate of someone who now had a job at Vignelli. So I wasn't even trying to see this character named Massimo Vignelli, who seemed almost mythical to me, the designer of, among other things, the New York subway map and the Bloomingdale's logo and St. Peter's Church and all this other stuff. St. Peter's Church in New York, not in Rome. Which I prefer. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, yeah. Over, yeah, you know, wretched excess in Rome, I think. I, I tried to get an appointment with this guy, but he said, just drop off your portfolio. Uh, we've got a deadline we're trying to meet. I'm really sorry if you drop it off and give my regards to my friend up in Boston. So I did, and then I went to pick up my portfolio. And I actually had inadvertently included things in my portfolio that really kind of match unknowing unknowingly to me sort of matched the way that Massimo Vignelli did sketches and and also I my work style was very sympathetic to the way he worked aesthetically again it wasn't calculated it just was coincidental to a certain degree but when I went to pick it up um it's again one of those indelible moments that I really remember just like the forklift truck logo just like seeing my uh poster on the wall that Monday morning. Um, I remember walking in to pick up my portfolio and I'd done this enough in New York where the, the cold, hard city and, you know, which one are you? Yeah, it's, you know, it's over there. Best of luck to you. You know, if they wouldn't even say that, they say, see, ya, you know, but I, I went in and I remember I said, um, I, I, you know, I was like dressed like a slob. I remember I had jeans and I had hiking boots and a flannel shirt and I look like crap. And I just, I was just, you know, I was walking around in New York in 1978 or nine or something. And so I went to pick up my portfolio and I remember I said, what my, I said, they said, uh, what's your name? And I said my name. And like the receptionist had sort of suddenly kind of didn't start exactly, but I could tell she opened her eyes a little bit wide and said, and sort of help us. Like, could you just wait a moment? Just take a seat over there. Okay. Then there was this whispered conversation she had on the phone and I was sort of like, did they lose what ha something bad happened? I guess what, you know, what's going on. And then suddenly this character who I would learn was Massimo Vignelli came barreling out from the back of the office and emerged in the reception area, started pumping my hand enthusiastically saying, it's great to meet you. Your portfolio is fantastic. I love looking at it. Just great, great, great. And sort of like, just kind of like peppering me with all these questions, gave me a tour of the office. It was a whirlwind. And I kind of found myself standing on the sidewalk some indeterminate time later trying to think what what just happened he seemed to have offered me a job while i was getting this like trip around and and like i sort of was like you know wow and i remember i actually it's like a hyperbolic tornado yeah, yeah. and he sort of i mean massimo famously he has one when he is awake and engaged, he basically, you know, everything is the most fantastic thing or the most awful thing. He's a natural enthusiast and kind of can't like something unless he is just head over heels in it. And I caught him on it. You know, it just so happened he saw my portfolio. He may have seen some things. He may have been predisposed for whatever reason, but he decided that it was the best portfolio he had seen either ever or maybe that day. I'd like some, somewhere in between <laughs> those two things and sort of came out and just kind of pumped the hell out of my hand, gave me this tour, said, I, you know, you've got to work here. Just let us know what happens after you graduate. My graduation was still a full year away. I remember kind of pecking out a letter saying, dear Mr. Vignelli, you may remember me and licking a stamp and sending it off to him and getting a letter back from someone else there saying, we don't have positions now, but stay in touch. And then a position opened up and I got a job there. And that was my first job getting out of school. So... At this time, you're married to Dorothy, yeah, you moved yeah. to New York with Dorothy, and you had a penchant for kind of going back to work. Yeah, we had this, we got this apartment uh, three blocks away from the what was then the Vignelli office at 62nd and 1st. We got an apartment at 65th and 1st. It was really tiny. 
And Dorothy had a job working at the World Trade Center, uh, the then fairly new, exciting World Trade Center, and I think Tower One. On the, it's, on, it's on the ninth floor or something. So she didn't get the benefit of the excitement of going to the top of this new landmark, uh, which, you know, eerie foreshadowing there, but she was long out of it by the time the century ended. But um, she would go, she had to get all dressed up and go downtown. She had a, a proper corporate job. I mean, she made much more money than I did, by the way. And also the places she worked had fabulous Christmas parties with like bowls of shrimp and waiters circulating with sushi that I sort of was stunned by, I remember. And I had this flunky job as the lowest person on the totem pole at Vignelli Associates. But because we lived just literally a four-minute walk away, she would go to bed really early every night. I could get to work. I could sleep until 9 o'clock and still, because I my ablutions in the morning were not that demanding. I would sort of like, you know, splash water on my face, pull on whatever least dirty flannel shirt I had and kind of show up. 20 minutes later and I could be at my desk by 930, you know, and so uh, she had to get up at like 530 to kind of start the march downtown. And so she'd go to bed four hours before I would. I would sort of wash all the dishes, restore order to the kitchen, kind of tidy up everything and then kind of like drum my fingers. And then I had a key to the office. I thought, yeah, I'm going to go back to work and just kind of like finish that thing. Right. And so I kind of ended up making a habit of that. She'd go to bed, then I'd go back to the office and to a degree that I used to think that that was great. And that was a secret of success and everyone should do that. And now with this kind of cult of hustle culture and everything, you know, it was emblematic of a way that I came to behave that I now regret. I'm very grateful that I've gotten to know all three of my children in adulthood and will never recapture moments in their childhood that Dorothy was witness to, where I was traveling or working late or involved in some silly thing memorialized with people whose names I've forgotten in those notebooks we were talking about. It's not for everybody, and I'm not sure it should have even been for me, you know, putting in that second shift every night. Harmless at that time was I had no kids and I had an unconscious uh, wife at home. So what she didn't know, and better I was doing that than gambling or, you know, other things you could do unbeknownst to her. But they noticed it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To Layla as well. I mean, we don't hear about Layla as much as Massimo, um, which is a shame. Although the last thing he designed, I remember, was a book about her work. Yeah, yeah, a beautiful book about her work. Yeah, so they were a couple, and she was actually the secret to the she, office. She you know, ran and, and if you knew the Vignellis, it was really clear who was in charge. And not only that, but who was the secret of uh, the success of that office. And I have, I, I, I came up with a really pleasing quote that I gave in a speech about her one time, where Massimo would always say, in our relationship, I'm the engine and Layla's the brakes. And all designers that hear that think, you know, yeah, brakes are necessary, but who doesn't want to be the engine? But then I remembered something I heard from my driving teacher back in high school, which is you don't die in a car because the engine won't start. You die in a car because the brakes fail. And it was Layla that kept that office alive all those years. She was just fantastic from that point of view. And I remember when I got hired, you know, Massimo would quote unquote hire you, but she would actually find out what the terms were from Mrs. Vignelli. You'd go into a room and she would say, so you are the new kid from Ohio. He says, so, you know, I think we started you as a junior designer and we pay you 13500 a year. Is that okay? And I was like, I'd never heard a sum that large related to anything connected with my life. I, you know, tried to stop my eyes from bulging out of my head in 1980, you know, $13,500 a year. Oh, my God, you know. And so, uh, but I, 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 you know, she would be the one who would actually make those arrangements. Uh, and, and in fact, it would conduct the annual reviews and kind of give you your raise or your bonus or stuff like that. She was just great. Yeah, she was amazing. What did you not like about how Massimo moved through the world? Um, like, what did you feel when you were that age? Maybe you felt different now. But when you looked at him and you thought, well, I'm working for this like superstar yeah. filled with charm. Yeah, yeah. Just unbelievable and very didactic and ideological. Yeah. Were there things that you thought, if I ever get to his stage, oh, I'm yeah, not yeah, going to yeah. do things that way? I mean, there, there are things that I things that I have modeled myself on very deliberately that, interestingly enough, have almost more to do with the way he managed people in the office, including me. But there were things that I really enjoyed about design that 
he had real antipathy towards, you know, like, and a couple of things. There were two things, there were two traits by him that I kind of thought, I'm just not like that. That isn't how I, you know, I'll never be able to work like that. One was he was one of these, he was like one of these designers, and I've met many of them, and it's a way to be a designer where he would almost start to know what the solution was before you had a chance to explain what the challenge was. He just would lunge right to the solution right away. And I'm like the opposite. I sort of try to hold off on thinking what the solution is because I keep thinking I'm going to hear one more thing or discover one more thing that would actually make the difference, right? And so, and, and it's a slightly the difference between, you know, he and Layla both trained as architects. And I think architects almost have to bring a standard operating procedure to the process because Frank Gehry is not going to decide every time what style shall this be. You know, it's going to be a Frank Gehry building, right? You know, if they come to Frank Gehry, they're getting a Frank Gehry building, right? And I think Massimo knew if they came to Vignelli Associates, they're getting a Vignelli design. And yet I sort of was really intrigued by the idea that a subway map could actually look a lot of different ways and still function. And then it, not only that, but the way it looked signaled something specific about the city it was representing or an attitude You're about- You're much more Socratic. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of what you don't know is more interesting. What you don't know is more interesting and I think much more pragmatic perhaps as well, more, more fit the thing to the moment. So there was that. I think that leads into the second thing, which is just a top, you know, an interest in, a, for me, a kind of almost dangerous and sometimes debilitating interest in other ways of doing things. Because you sort of, at the end of the day, you inevitably have a kind of handwriting that defines what your style is. I would see something that looked cool, and I would think, I'm going to make the next thing I do look that cool. At Vignelli, that temptation was withdrawn, more or less, because everything was supposed to look like Massimo's work. Red, and I black, was, and white, I, you know, Yeah, and I was extremely good at making things look like Massimo's work. There are things up in the Vinelli archives at the Rochester Institute of Technology that I see they sometimes put on social media. They say, here's Massimo's sketches for this thing. And I say, I can tell that those are my sketches, you know? And I learned to sketch exactly the way he did. And weirdly, not because I, I wasn't trying to um, flatter him. I wasn't trying to trick anyone of thinking that, you know, Mr. Vignelli did these sketches, not me. It was just sort of, you know, just sort of like if you're around someone who speaks with a certain accent, sometimes you start speaking in that same accent. You yeah, know? the language of the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not as useful in some situations and actually not good in others. So. Well, it's, it's style as a trap. It was a yeah. trap in an environment intentionally. Yeah, yeah, Whereas, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, then you moved 32 years ago, you moved to Pentagram. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that wasn't easy to leave. Yeah, no, it was a terror. Uh, the day that I went in to resign to Mr. And Mrs. Vignelli was sort of really terrible. And every single time, every time someone comes into my office and I can always tell, oh, shit, this is that meeting. I've had so many people work for me over the years I and mean, I've really loved most of them. And every time they come in that room, I sort of, you know, said, well, this was inevitable from the day this person was hired and they didn't know anything. And then they really get good at what they're doing. And then they get really good at what they're doing. Then they realize, what do I need him for? And then they start planning about this day. And now the day has come. And every single time I can tell that they were scared, that they were rehearsing it in their mind the night before, they were freaking out. And I just feel like I, if there's ever a moment that I just feel absolutely kind and receptive and I'm just like, you know, I know I, I really, I, I mean, my heart goes out to them because I remember in, um, yeah, how did they respond to you? Oh, it was, I, you know, I think I, I did, you know, like, like one does, I sort of told their secretary, I told their assistant, Laura Hillier, I said, the Vignelli's both going to be in on Monday. And, um, and she said, uh, she said, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, they're, they'll both be in. They'll both be in late in the morning. I says, can you just, can you just make some time in their calendar? I want to see both of them together at like 11. And she says, why? What is it? And I said, oh, you know, I just want to talk to them together. But I sort of like, that could only be about one thing, in my opinion. So I sort of thought, well, at least, you know, they sort of know that the fix is in, right? I think they were prepared to make a counter argument or sort of like talk to me. What they weren't prepared for, Massimo was not prepared for all that I was going to leave and join Pentagram, who he saw as a, an inferior competitor, actually. And in fact, the 
the problem that he saw with Pentagram was the thing that made it so appealing to they me. Have a style. Which, you know, which it's, if you don't know how Pentagram's organized, it's a consortium founded by five designers, each of whom had their own way of working, decided to work in this loose confederation with no hierarchy, no managing director, no boss, share space, share income, share resources, but really operate autonomously within that style within that format and um it ended up being something that was expandable it ended up something where they could take they could experiment and bring new people in i joined almost the same time that peter savile joined we both joined in uh, 1990 he made it 24 months i made it 32 years and counting he barely made it yeah months. he barely made it 24 <laughs> months but but like you know it was amazing it was still um you know i know that he considered it a great learning experience, and I think Pentagram was the better for having had him pass through. And as they, you know, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and I know they had a, a dinner there with the London partners past and present, and Peter was there alongside John McConnell, the guy who, um, he went in for advice who hired him. So it's a, it's really a, uh, I say, you know, I went from a monotheistic society to a pantheistic society. You know, many gods arranged in a circle, just like uh, uh, that building in Rome, right? And I... Um, and so the destabilization where there wasn't one right way to do things, I thought that was like, it's like anathema to Massimo. And in fact, you know, he just thought it had, what's interesting is, as far as I know, he respected the individual partners at Pentagram quite a bit, but just didn't understand this insanity of kind of having this. So he was disappointed in you. Oh, yeah. Like, no, he was like, he couldn't believe I was joining, but, and he, and he sort of, I think, miss, he sort of assumed that I was trading in him as a father figure for one of the senior partners who ran, who then was the most senior partner in the New York office, Colin Forbes, and sort of trading in one white-haired Italian guy for a white-haired English guy. But instead, the promise that I had at Pentagram was, no one would tell me what typeface to use, no one would tell me what client to work for or not. I think I said to the Vignellis, you know, you let me do whatever I want. I can come and go as I please. They gave me so much liberty, but still it was like living in that apartment over your garage at your parents' place. And you know, if you bring a girl home, but still, you still kind of feel like, you know, funny about it, you know? I, I, and I know nothing about it. The, the scenario I just described, it's obviously completely foreign to my experience. <laughs> never brought a girl home, never lived in an apartment or a garage. But I sort of thought, you, eventually you have to move out and yeah. kind of like figure out what your life's going to be. I'd been working at uh, at uh, Vignelli for like one third of the life I'd been on earth, started there at 22, 21, 22, made it to 32, 33. And then managed to have a wonderful friendship with them the rest of their yeah, yeah, lives. Yeah, afterwards, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is rare. Yeah, no, it took, a, there, was a, there was a period of, of estrangement at the very beginning, but then Massimo, Massimo is just such a warm person that he can't be mad at people that long. And he knew that I sort of uh, credited so much of the way I think about things and so much of the way I, I work as a designer to those formative years I had working for him and Layla. So when asked about books you love, there was this one piece I found where you went through all these books that you love. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Fountainhead. Yeah, yeah. And Anne Rand's book, specifically because of a quote, I don't build in order to have clients. I have clients in order to build. Yeah, yeah. Rourke's, you know, the architect's idea. Yeah. You know, which kind of leads me to a bit of, of, of time I want to spend on clients and yeah, yeah. your perspective on it. So first of all, are you enjoying the relative ease of booking clients at this point in your career? Or is it an assumption that there is a relative ease? Well, I mean, there's two parts to it. I mean, certainly doing this a long time, you don't, you're not a better designer in terms of the craft. And in fact, I'm a worse designer, uh, partly because the fact that I, I'm not a digital native really ends up being uh, like a, an obstacle in my mind that is hard. I think that, you know, certain habits that I kind of came in terms of problem solving, I really have trouble um, getting around. When, so my, my design skills, I'm not sure they're improved. And in fact, maybe they've degraded. Luckily, I have really good people working with me as my partners at Pentagram and really good people working for me on my team. But the one thing I am like I'm older and wiser and I can kind of, you know, I can talk fairly directly and without much fear to a potential client or to an actual client. And I really, and I've come to really, really enjoy that. Like, it's like, you know, I guess what Rourke says in that book, I have clients in order to build. You do need clients in order to do it. He sort of um, makes them sound like they're just instruments in his will to be used or abused or, and discarded. Although, um, 
people make fun of Ayn Rand all the time, and um, Alice Shrugged is not just preposterous, but sort of like seems to be actually dangerous for like adult people to mostly adult men, I guess, to somehow fix it too that strongly. Now. There's a lot of that out there right now. But The Fountainhead actually, it's like, it's a little bit trashy, but it's, I think it's a legitimately good book and it's a fairly well-rounded and interesting portrait of how to live a creative life. And I remember reading that and thinking, oh, this guy wants to create things and I'm sort of the same way. So I read it in high school and it really took me. Like, I wasn't interested in the exciting sex scenes or things. Uh, Dorothy and I don't have that kind of uh, Gary Cooper um Patricia Neal relationship, usually. But on the other hand, like the way he's just sort of like his excitement about combining sort of the brief he's getting from a client who wants to do something, realizing that client's chosen him because there's some sort of symbiosis between the designer's vision and what the client wants to achieve, even if the client can't quite express it. You know, that's very real in life. You know, I still have moments where I think, does this never get easier? Like coming once again to the same sort of roadblock or miniature crisis that I remember coming to in 1982 and 1992 and 2002 and 2012. Here it is again, 2012 and 2022. I'm still having this goddamn conversation about why something should be this way. Just do it my way because because I know what I'm doing. But I never play that card because I learned that um, that clients who at the end of the day are sort of like enabling this work to happen, you know, they come at it. Some people come into my office and it's like Christmas morning. They just can't wait to see what's in the package and they're just inclined to be excited. Some people are like insecure jerks ordering wine in a restaurant and trying to impress their date. You know, they don't know anything about wine. I'm going to order the most expensive thing at the best restaurant. Here I am at the best restaurant. I'm ordering the most expensive wine. And now just because like I have no idea what good or bad wine is, I'm going to pretend that I actually do. I'm going to pretend to send this bottle back because it'll make me seem cool and it's a power play. You sort of see that behavior too. And it's just human nature, you know, it's like, um, and in the midst of it all, I'm just trying to do what I think is the right thing, not just for the client, but by whoever the end recipient of this thing is supposed to be, you know, the, it could be the client's employees or internal audience. It could be the audience for the work that's out there somehow. And you just have to figure it out and work. Something I think I've learned and, and many people from my generation have learned from you is that the notion of educating your clients may not be the best approach. <laughs> no, no. Which we came up with this yeah, sort yeah. of design thinking, yep, yep. human yeah, yeah. This whole IDEO push yeah, yeah, for a yeah. period was, well, you have to educate your clients. Yeah. It doesn't work, does it? No, not only doesn't it work, but I think it's presumptuous and kind of like a bizarre way to think about the world. I remember what I was like before I went to design school. Then I went to design school for five years. I came out different at the other end, right? And I came out different and like, now I was bizarre. I wasn't normal anymore. But luckily, I remember I remember what it was like to be normal. And I'm married to people who are normal. And I have children who are normal. I have, I, and I know people who are like normal people who don't know the names of typefaces, who aren't expected to care about all these things. And that's not a moral failing on their part that I need to correct before I can have a proper conversation with them. Instead, what they do know are all these interesting things that I have no idea about because, again, one of the reasons I int- I'm interested in graphic design because it's always about something else. And it says something else that they know about that if I – my ability to demonstrate to them that I'm really listening attentively to what they're talking about tends to be the magic trick. It's just the difference between going to the doctor and just, you know, you feel comfortable if they really seem to be attending to, tell me again what hurts. Does it hurt when you wake up? What if I do this? Does this make it better or worse? What if the doctor didn't do that and just said, hi, you know, this, thanks for coming by. This is what I'm famous for. You know, bend over. And it's I'm, funny you say that because Massimo <laughs> used to say, he said this to me several yeah. times is, you come to me, I give you a diagnosis. Yeah. Go to another doctor if, if you want a second opinion. Yeah. But this is my diagnosis. Yeah, and, and actually, no, and I think there's another way. There's, you know, the thing I described, which is the good bedside manner thing. You really do have to be a good diagnostician in order to be a good doctor. You have to listen attentively and understand really what the issue is, right? But then I think then you have to be decisive about what the remedy is. And I, I I just recently, we got involved with this thing where it just, there were too many iterations. And finally, there was this a middle manager, you know, someone in, in management had kind of concocted this presentation for upper management that was like, here are all 32 variations, you know, and it's a little bit spot the difference. And I said, this is like going to the doctor, the doctor 
here's what you've got. Says, thank you for telling me all your symptoms. Now let's visit the pharmacy and just like, let's look at all the pills and you tell me which one you like the best. <laughs> you know, these are the round ones. These are the square ones. These are lozenge shaped. These are pink. These are blue. What do you like? Do you like pink shapes that are, you like pink round ones? Yeah. Or do you like blue lozenge shaped ones? Like that's not what you, why you go to the doctor no. for a tour of the pharmacy. You go to the doctor, he's like, here's the pill that cures that thing that I think you've got, right? But there's somewhere that you figured out a space between their ambitions and yeah. their blind spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you get there through inquiry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that that sort of is, like, when in doubt, just ask another question. When in doubt, just shut up and listen. You can tell I like to talk. And so it's really hard. For, then I realized I was never learning anything by making these speeches. You know, I was sort of demonstrating, don't worry, I sort of understand, you know. Well, in this context, it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know what I mean, though. But it's like, you don't learn by talking. You learn no. by listening. So. so I want to get into a couple of the projects before we're done. One of them is specific to how important it is to have a limited perspective on, despite the fact that Dorothy's an MBA, you know very little about finance or did before yeah. you worked in these projects. So in 2014, MasterCard evolved the iconic red and yellow circles, yeah. and which is one of my favorite personal pieces of yours because oh, thank you, thank you. something happened in there where you showed us that we know more than we think we do about a brand. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So... What was the process? What did you learn coming out of it about your approach to it? Maybe what didn't work along the way? Well, our client at MasterCard was fantastic, by the way. And really, um, interestingly enough, you know, they came to us and they sort of had refreshed the basic MasterCard logo many times. And specifically, several years ago, um, when they came to us and we did this work, the specific problem on the table was largely... There were some specific problems that some of which were like purely technical. For instance, over almost the entire 50-year history of that logo, which had always from the beginning consisted of a yellowish circle overlapping with a reddish circle for no, no reason that people knew for sure, but it looked like it was maybe some sort of flat representation of the two hemispheres, Eastern and Western hemisphere or something. People didn't quite know what it was. But from the very beginning, it was those two, that shape with the word MasterCard, a 10-letter word superimposed on top of it. And uh, over the years, it had been updated, modernized, jazzed up, turned into an italic thing, some sort of back when everything had horizontal lines, they worked in didn't some know horizontal what it was lines. For a long time. You know, and then it, it existed as a sticker on windows. And because the colors would fade when it was on windows, they put some what designers call drop shadows, little black outlines behind the, the name. So even if the colors faded, the name would still pop out. So it had gotten really complicated, which all made it sort of disastrous in the digital realm, where if you were kind of sorting through possible payment alternatives, one of them was MasterCard reduced to just a handful of pixels wide, it would look like gobbledygook and insane, right? So there was that. There's also the fact that it had the word card in it, and they were moving towards a they were already well in a, an environment of payments that had nothing to do with plastic cards, had everything to do with the transfer of, uh, of data. And it had the word master in it, which even a few years ago was starting to kind of have some unsavory connotations about, um, you know, this country's legacy Capital of slavery. M Capital M, M MasterCard, right? And so every, you know, so even that name itself was becoming problematic. And certainly any 10-letter word superimposed on top of a shape is going to be a tough thing to sort out. So they came to us and they said, you have an, we're trying to figure this out. You have an open brief, figure it out. And they had one interesting statistic at that time, which is that companies do a lot of research about who recognizes our logo. And if you showed people two circles, a red circle and a yellow circle, I think then it, it was in the upper 80s, they would say that's MasterCard, which is like amazing. But it's, it's not so amazing when you think they've been doing it for half a century, right? You can't do that overnight. You really have to make an investment. You can't get in a time machine and make that investment. You have to have magically done it 50 years ago, then somehow not gotten around to completely throwing it out in the intervening five decades, right? So they had that. And so we eventually came around to a solution that I don't think was clever or required that much. It required a lot of precision and craftsmanship, but not a whole lot of imagination in terms of the insight. I think it was just there. It's like, what if the logo was just those two circles? Hamish Smythe, who was a designer working with me then, had this, you know, it used to be where the circles overlapped, it got darker. It was a 
you know, two colors made a darker color. And he said, what if we made that a lighter color? And so that lightened the whole thing up and introduced this element of- It was a subtle shift. Yeah. That- causes a kind of illumination yeah yeah exactly it's well it's actually a different you, you know it's a different kind of color theory it's yeah. like additive versus subtractive yeah. color theory and and not only that but there's this interesting kind of simultaneous contrast where the lighter colors hit the darker colors and kind of introduce some shading in there that kind of isn't quite skeuomorphic in its nature you know a little bit of modeling that's that you think is there that's not really there that we thought was kind of really cool. There's some people- There's that's, a time element too. I mean, yeah. kind of like Albers and color theory. Yeah, the yeah. cones in your eyes do adjust when you look yeah, at yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something yeah. occurs physically. Oh, and, and in our presentation, we had uh, Johannes Itten and we had Albers. We had all the color theorists there sort of saying, and we kind of tested those colors up one side and down the other. But basically it was that question of how much can I take away and still make this be recognizable. Very Vignelli idea. Yeah. Very Vignelli idea and also very fundamental to the way we perceive things. At the same time, I was reading this book about um, minimalism and art and neuroscience. I forget the name of the author, but he's a professor up at Columbia. And he sort of really was talked about how we perceive the world, how sighted people perceive the world as, as babies and how you start to process the way shapes present themselves to you and how that initial... Mm -hmm processing you do as an infant still kind of plays through to the rest of your life as you're interpreting the visual world. And to be able to kind of like back that into something like a symbol was really exciting. And then, and then, like you said, it goes on millions and 2.3 billion yeah. 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 minimum places. Yeah. And it's the thing about that kind of deployment yeah. of a solution. It's just staggering. It's staggering. And on the other hand, again, if I told my mother-in-law, I would never say this, but Dorothy said, you know, Michael designed that logo. She would look at these two colored circles and think, you what know, I do? don't get it. Can you, you show me that drawing he did of, you know, of that seal at the zoo? I thought that was cooler looking, you know. But so. the inevitability yeah. is something that you strive yeah. for. Another project I wanted to bring up was the Robin Hood Foundation work, which has yeah. had serious impact. Yeah, yeah. But in an unlikely way. Yeah, yeah. So... The Robin Hood Foundation is a New York-based um, philanthropy that raises money mostly from kind of the financial services sector, hedge fund guys and things like that, and then redirects it to people in need in New York City, does it, I think, with the same kind of rigor that these hedge fund guys are accustomed to bringing to the investments they make, except Robin Hood is doing it in the public sector and, and, and is really an effective and exciting uh, philanthropy, in my opinion. They announced this project called, I forget whether we helped name it or it was like the library project, but it, be, it became the, we called the library initiative at the end. And what they had decided was they wanted to do something that had some impact in New York City public schools. They didn't have the resources to actually renovate New York City public schools from top to bottom, but they had this other idea, which was what if we only renovated a single room in as many schools as we could, and what if that room was the library? And so um, they had, at that time, a really dynamic uh person named Lonnie Tanner, who was succeeded by a really dynamic person there named Susan Sack, who together sort of rallied the design community to support this project. Got Un a, unreal. Yeah, got amazing designers to design these libraries, everyone from David Rockwell to uh, Todd Williams, Billy Chen, to, you know, uh, just great designers were working on these uh, libraries. And we were sort of asked to be the consultant graphic designers for it. And it seemed like what they wanted was just a logo for the project. So I designed a bunch of clever logos that were all too clever that Lonnie and correctly rejected all of them because they were all about trying to make the logo interesting. And in fact, what was supposed to be interesting was the libraries, not the logo for the libraries. And by the way, the function for the logo wasn't for the kids who know a library when they see it. Yeah, it, but like it was, it was actually to make, sort of make this thing make sense at the donor level. Oh, wow. And make it make sense to like at the BOE, at the Board of Education level. So these things would all hang together. This is all one big idea because the libraries, in fact, all look different. All these different designers did these very different sort of stylistic approaches to how they'd renovate these libraries. And they're just fantastic, beautiful, beautiful things. Then someone said, well, if you're the graphic designer, can you do some graphics inside the libraries too? And I said, sure, what do you need? And it turns out that even though these libraries are all different, even though the architects are all different, almost all of them had the same physical condition or physical opportunity in them, which is that they were all in older buildings with very high ceilings. It's nice. But they were all like for, uh, they were all primary schools at that time. 
And so the shelves could only go so high. So the shelves would go up maybe five, six feet, but then the ceiling was at 12 feet, which meant above the shelves was a six foot space that had nothing in it. So they said, um, someone put the question to me, can you design some sort of mural or something go in the space? So suddenly I've, I've gone from agreeing to design a logo for free for the cause to being Diego Rivera or something. And I said, you know, I'm not, what is this, the WPA? I'm not a muralist, you know, this takes real skill to do. First, I said, no. Then I said, well, let's think about this. Then I came up with this idea that, you know, maybe we could do something photographic, make a photo mural, then print it out digitally and just kind of apply it like wallpaper above. So it was sort of easier to do. And I got back my lovely wife, Dorothy, who then had retired from the MBA world and had taken some classes at ICP and was experimenting with photography. I got her to do a photo session of kids in this one school. And then we just kind of like made this giant photo mural of their faces up above. And what I wanted was it to feel like you were in a little, the library itself was a little model and these big kids were looking in at you with the library. And this proved all the library. And by the way, Robin Hood had also embarked on this program of training a special cohort of New York City public public school librarians to be really great librarians yeah. too. They were already good librarians, but they sort of like enlisted them in going, I think, up to Syracuse for special classes that were just designed for them. All these librarians knew each other and they all knew this library in East New York had this fancy mural. And all of them said, I want one of those murals. I want that mural in my school. But then fatally we said, well, this ain't Starbucks. We're not just going to roll out this wallpaper the same in every school. Those kids are in that school. Let's just do a different mural for every library. So cool. And so we embarked on this program to do all these mur different murals in every library and uh, ended up doing probably in the end 50 or so. But the first wave we did was 10. This was all being done pro bono. So it wasn't like, you know, people were on site monitoring things all the time. You would sort of prepare the artwork, trust the architects and the contractors to get the thing done properly. They'd send you pictures, they'd call you up if it wasn't quite fitting, but basically a lot of it was done by remote control. But we had so many people involved with it, including illustrators, photographers, designers back in my office. And when the first 10 were all done, and I'd visited a few on opening day, and it's really touching to kind of go to them and see them filled with kids. And so I said, why don't we just kind of rent a van and just hit as many of these libraries as we can just to see how cool they look. And so we just did that, and the librarians were really, um, they, they, you know, what's interesting, they were genuinely excited to meet the people behind the murals. It was funny. It was for once in my, although usually my role, again, was somewhat confusing. Oh, I love those pictures. Well, actually, Dorothy took the pictures. I love those illustrations. Actually, Peter Arkell did the illustrations. What did you do? Well, that logo that says the one that says library. Oh, yeah. Mm, OK. <laughs> so at any rate, but like I was still really happy and proud. I, I still remember that van ride from uh, Brooklyn. We ended up in the Bronx and the last place we went was in the Bronx. It was uh, probably fall, late fall this time of year, got dark early and um the librarian, we were was shutting the library down and she said, um, I'll show you how I turn out the lights. And uh the architect had provided some up lights on the mural, and um, she said, I always turn them off in this order. And she turned off the lights on the mural last, and it was a mural of kids' faces from the school. And she said, I just, I do this because I like to remind myself, you know, why why I show up for work every day. I always choke up when I say that. Yeah. And, uh, and I'd like to say, you know, that was the plan. You know, by golly, you know, motivating these librarians, that was the plan all along. I mean, that's real. Yeah. And, it, and, and like, that wasn't the plan at all. It just was yeah. a series of expedient decisions we were making, guided by some sort of, I think, benevolent, optimistic intuition that led us down a good path. But it was never, you know, I never actually, now that I think through, it's like, you're not going to change the, the instrument. The thing you're trying to change is the lives of the librarians, because they're the instrument by which... You know, their will is the Which one that never shapes. Thought of. Yeah, never thought of that. I never thought of that. I never, ever, ever thought of that. And it just goes to show you that when you do design work, if it's in public, it's going to have um, unintended consequences. And if you're lucky, those consequences are a force for good in the world. And it makes me think about how, because of your specific intent of learning about the world, graphic design is mm -hmm. a passport. Yeah. This must have really felt like you arrived at a place you would have never been yeah, yeah. unless yeah, yeah. you had this vehicle to be there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. A lot of times when I'm, if, if I have an intern in the office and I'm giving them a job, when I'm, I'm sort of asking them to help on a project, when I brief them, I'll always like sort of describe what the big 
picture is. Here's the big idea. This is what this is all about. I think it'd be more efficient just to say, look, this thing has to be four feet tall and it's got to, I need a file and it has to be done by four o'clock and just move all these things to the left to make sure this orange here doesn't about this green thing here and uh, show it to um, uh, to Johnny and he'll just make sure it's okay before we ship it. And Johnny, look at the problem, make sure that um, the intern here gets it right. Instead, I'll say, look, we're doing this project and it's murals all over the city. And sometimes they look at me uncomprehendingly, sort of like waiting to hear, what do I have to do exactly? You know, yeah, just, where's the how? Yeah, just- Because you've given me the why. Yeah, just, just, just tell me how big it has to be and when you need it done. Yeah, yeah. And instead, I think that's not, that, who cares how big it is and when it has to be done? That's, of course you have to get that right, but it's, the why that is the I mean they thing. often say like satisfaction comes from purpose not yeah yeah not outcomes exactly exactly and and happiness in your in your work comes from purpose what are you most looking forward to at this point in your professional journey you're in act three of working yeah. what are you most looking forward to now I think there's probably a chance for me to I wrote a book, oddly not called Why, but called How To. Yeah. That, that, which is a whole lot of why, yeah, by yeah, the yeah. way. <laughs> which is mostly, yeah, it's actually a, um, a little bit of a Trojan horse. I remember the publisher was always disconcerted because it didn't have like that many useful, that much useful information. It's all in why. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all, all why. It's all why, yeah. And uh, of course, Pentagram has this book out now that's about the 50th anniversary of Pentagram, this humongous thing about me and the other 50 odd partners that have passed through over the past half a century. But I keep thinking there's like, um, I'd love to figure out some way to kind of not codify as much, but just sort of get down on paper some of the underlying ideas that I found really motivating in my life. So I guess the short answer is maybe I'll write a book. But um, I hate writing. I, I mean, I find it really, I find writing really unbelievably unpleasant. It brings out the procrastinator in me. So, um, but I, I think if I actually move to a point where I kind of can do a little less kind of day-to-day -day client work. I wouldn't mind actually just thinking it all through and making sure some of the things I just say off the cuff as I have in this great conversation with you, Andrew, if I could figure out some way to just kind of get it straight in my own mind and get it down on paper, it'd be satisfying for me and it might be useful to someone eventually. I think it'd be eventually. very useful to a lot of people who've looked up to you for many years. Thank you for joining us today, Michael. Man, a real pleasure. Great talking to you. Thank you. Extra thanks to our season six sponsor, Le Col School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. A unique place for learning, Le Col welcomes the general public to the world of jewelry through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications. You can find more about Le Col at www.lecolvancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancarpels.com. L-E-E-F-A-R-P-E-L-S dot com. And thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of Time Sensitive on our website, timesensitive.fm, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can listen to our other podcasts at a distance by heading to atadistancepodcast.com. You can follow us on Instagram at slowdown.tv. And if you like our programs, please be sure to subscribe and leave comments. Our theme music was composed by Billy Martin. This episode was produced by Ramon Broza, Emily Jang, and Johnny Simon. 